from then on, I, I, I carried on traveling. I flew to Turkey and hitchhiked to Israel, and I started averaging about 10 countries a year. I still had no real money. I mean, the book, money I made from the books lasted a little while, but essentially, I was just abusing people's kindness and hospitality, you know, because I came out of India after a year and a half of being this dream. I had no idea that people still paid rent or had jobs or anything. So quite a long time for this information to sink in, you know. But as far as I went, flat out. As far as I went, the like, fuses I got, and the one thing I learned was never to lose hope. <laughs> and so it happened a few weeks before the millennium. I was staying on a friend's couch in my hometown, been back there a few weeks, hand to mouth to windy, it was supposed to get published, but the date was being delayed. And my friend obviously wanted to get rid of me, and you know, I'd been there about two weeks already, eating from his refrigerator, you know. And I had about 10 pounds to my name. And I was really feeling a bit gloomy, you know, and the skies were dark. And I walked into town, into a bookshop, and I was just browsing through the books, and I found this book on Jewish mysticism. Well, I don't know anything about that, so I picked it up, and on the page, the page I flicked to, there was this phrase from this rabbi, and it said, the only real sin is to lose hope. Despair is the only real sin. I thought, I like that. I looked at it suspiciously, picked it up, and I heard a voice from a guy called Clive, who I'd met in India. He went, Tom, is that you? Oh, thank God. Listen, I don't know if you heard, my girlfriend just got arrested in Delhi airport with five kilos of hashish. <laughs> what are you doing these days, Tom? I don't suppose you mind flying out to India, would you? To go and visit her in jail and see the lawyer and that. I'll pay for everything. Six days later, I was on a flight to India. <laughs> embarking on this story. And that was the amazing thing, just how your world could flip around in a matter of a heartbeat. But this journey kind of broke my love affair with India in many ways. You know, before then, I'd just been with travelers hanging out in chai shops and on the beaches and the parties. And sure, I'd hitched through India and traveled a bit, but I never really had to get that far involved. And now I had to go to the jail and meet lawyers. And the very first time I went to see his girlfriend in jail there, I went along to Tihar jail at 8 o'clock in the morning and signed my name, completely paranoid the police might grab me, waited for four hours, and then we came to walk in tight, the, visit, the visiting room, where I imagined we'd sit down at a table and have a civilized conversation about the best way to get her out, of, out of jail. But instead, there was a huge queue of pushing Indians, because the queue system has never really sunk in in India. It's every person for themselves, right? And they were pushing so much, I actually leant back on them like this as we were walking closer to the gate. And then I got searched by the guards at the gate. And later I found out why they were being so prohibitive. And when you go to Tihar jail to visit somebody, you can't take any sweets or chocolates. Because once upon a time, somebody had given some drug sweets to a guard, the guard fell asleep, and the prisoner escaped. So no more sweets. No plastic bags. Because one prisoner had tried to make a key from all these scrunched up plastic bags. And if any of you have ever seen Indian locks, they're really not that hard to pick. He'd picked the lock with this improvised plastic key and escaped. So no plastic bags, and I'm holding all the fruit and cake and bread and everything in my arms. And then they pulled out the bananas, too. Any guesses? It being a female jail, and of course in India, morality always being a very high concern. <laughs> they were worried that some of their female prisoners might be using these bananas for immoral purposes. And so we go in, and there's two dark corridors. And I'm thinking, well, there must be a door here somewhere. And everyone's already running. There's bells ringing. You can hardly hear a thing. And suddenly I hear Natasha's voice on the other side of two fences, screaming my name. And I said, oh, where can we talk? She says, here. <laughs> here? You have to fight. These people are animals. So OK. So I find myself a place at the fence by elbowing someone to the side, and I start behaving like everybody else. And now suddenly we're yelling between these two fences at each other, so what about the lawyer? She goes, where's Clive? And I don't know. We're yelling, this is how we have to talk. And then suddenly she just starts losing it and starts banging her head against the fences and just screams, there's no God in here. There's no God in here. And that was how we started. And it's carried on for the next four months before we finally managed to get her free a couple of months later by bribing, I shouldn't say this on camera, by, uh, 
by finding a creative solution and uh, rewarding an Indian judge for their uh, diligence and uh, sense of justice. <laughs> but this really was the flip side of the whole India traveller trip. I never really thought about it before, but loads of the travellers who were actually on the road I saw every year, they were all smugglers. That was what they did, that's how they were there. When well, they weren't working for a living, everyone would go back with hash inside their shoes or in their suitcase, or they'd swallow half a kilo and go. And that was how they lived. And what happened was, that was fine when it was fine, but when things went wrong and someone went to jail or hospital, if things went wrong inside their stomach, there was almost no one there. And that really showed me something about the whole traveller trip. And those couple of years in Goa that I was there, four or five years, about three and a half years I was there in total in India, I'd caught the last wave of a freak scene that happened in the 60s and then turned to a techno movement in the late 80s and was now crashing on the shore of development. I was all over, really. The mafia were coming in, the police were coming in, and the freaks were getting kicked out, even though they were the ones who started the whole scene and brought the money there. So suddenly, I was at quite a loss for myself. I couldn't hang out in Goa anymore. India had lost its charm. And it was time for me to try and encounter the rest of the world. I just went from extreme situation to extreme situation, living on miracles the entire time. I always find myself the new language and a new culture and a new economy, meeting new people in new places, always living on the edge. And if I got addicted to it, if I hung around anywhere for a couple of, more than a couple of weeks, it felt boring. Conversations in people's houses felt dull. I was like, is this it? Is that all there is? And so I took ever more random roads I could possibly find. And each of these roads I took really just took me even further away from myself. <laughs> Until it came 2001, I decided to try and restart my life. You know, I took a whole new direction. So I took a one-way ticket to Thailand, and I arrived there with about 100 pounds in my pocket that I'd uh, begged off the English government for a few weeks. And my, job, my idea was to teach English. I feel like, I speak English. I can, I, how hard can it be to teach it, you know? I had enough money to last me about three weeks, confident of finding a job. I arrived in Thailand and discovered that the whole country was on holiday for a month. <laughs> Great planning, huh? Research. So I turned to the traveler's best friend, internet, still something quite novel in those days. And I looked at all the English teaching sites and I found out that in South Korea, not only did they pay you a lot more, about $2,000 a month, they gave you a free apartment as well. And they paid for your flight ticket there. I was like, wow, this is great. Scanned on the page, oh, but you need a university diploma. So until then, of course, I just had a degree from the University of Life, I think first off at 18. But I was always told education is something you should invest in. So I headed down to Kosan Road and bought myself a fake <laughs> diploma for 50 bucks. <laughs> a new graduate in English literature from Sussex University. I posted it off to a, a career agent in Seoul. And he set about getting me a job called me up about a week later and said, yeah, I got your diploma, all looks good. Uh, do you happen to have your transcripts with you? Transcripts? I didn't even know what transcripts were. <laughs> I was like, I wonder if that's something that's too big to fit in my rucksack. Could I blag that? <laughs> anyway, he was a bit uneasy about it, but he swallowed this lack of transcripts. And before long, I flew to South Korea, and I arrived with about 10 pounds left in my pocket, really on the edge now. And I don't know how the rest of South Korea is, but at least the town I was in was a tedious, boring, corporate hell. We walked into English school, there were 30 bosses, it seemed, all dressed up in uniforms, and it felt like I couldn't last a month in that place, never mind a year. So it was kind of a relief when in one of my lessons, when I could finally get the students to talk, because every time I'd ask them a question, the girls would say, <laughs> and cover their mouth. The guys I'd ask a question, they'd say, Didn't you? No! Oh! Okay, 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 never mind. Just the exercise on the board, it's all right. And so midway through one of my lessons, in about my beginning of my third week, I think, 
the manager walks in, this American Korean woman called Mary, bless her, and she said, um, Teacher Tom, uh, could you just join me outside for a moment? I said, yes, sure. Okay, class, continue with what's on the board. Okay. Walked out into the corridor, and she said, um, this is kind of embarrassing. Uh, I just came back from the immigration office. The man there doesn't think your diploma is real. Uh, I told him it was, but would you just mind calling your university for us to confirm everything? So I had to do some very fast thinking. This is November 2001. So I said, yeah, sure, Mary, I'd love to. But thing is, since 9-11, there's all kinds of new security, you know, about identity and all of this. I'm going to have to write them a letter, you know, get my social security number before they release that kind of information. And she wasn't very happy about it, but I managed to hold out just until my first paycheck. <laughs> and the atmosphere in the school in those last few days before my paycheck, I tell you, the directors were staring at us, you know, you're going to make a run for it, aren't you? And I was like, talking about buying a car or something, you know, to prove I was going to stay there. Got the first pay in my pocket, and of course jumped on the first boat to Japan. <laughs> Why Japan? Because I'd heard, reliably, from travelers that I'd met in India, Israeli travelers, because I spent some time in Israel in the meantime, that you could make a killing on the streets of Tokyo, selling silver rings, cotton bracelets, and fake Rolex watches. So I phoned up one of the Israeli bosses, because by that time, the, the Israeli, Israelis pretty much dominated the street markets there, the kind of the Israeli mafia, they made all the deals with the Japanese mafia for the places. The deal was you turned up, they gave you a place on the street, a few lessons in selling, gave you the security of the Japanese mafia, Yakuza, and then you got 40% of what you sold. You know, this seemed better than teaching English in Korea. <laughs> so I flew to Tokyo, and I quickly realized I was, walk I was about to work with sharks. I mean, these people were ruthless, you know. They'd be like, of course it's real silver <laughs> on their street stall every day. And when the Israelis met the Japanese, it was like a new predator walking into an ecology that had never had predators before. They just devoured them. You know, the Israelis having no real sense of borders, and the Japanese not knowing how to confront anybody. And so they, they took millions and millions and millions out of Japan over the years, and they're still doing it. Um, fair play, you know. So the first thing to do was get me trained up, right? So I was introduced to some of the workers on the street. And the first guy I was taken to see was a very tall Israeli called Yoni. I came along to his stall in the middle of this busy shopping area. And he looked me up and down and said, so, are you Jewish? I was like, uh, well, no. He goes, ah, no one's perfect. <laughs> now, Yoni's method of selling, uh, I'm not sure you'd find this taught in any course anywhere. He had a large inflatable hammer. And when the Japanese would cross the road towards him, at this pedestrian crossing, he'd run over, hit them on the head with the hammer, <laughs> grab the first one who was dazed, all the way over to his stall, and even if he didn't stay, other Japanese would come along following the movement. <laughs> he said, you see, Tommy? These people are like animals. They are sheep. We are the wolves. I said, how the fuck am I ever going to do this job?